From the family grocery hauler to fire-breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor and Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615-726-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rem Speedway. Highland Rem Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door -door stock car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. The celebration is underway in Las Vegas where NASCAR will formalize the coronation of Brad Keselowski as their new champion. I'm Joe Williams and coming up with Larry Woody, we'll take a look at how a one night celebration has turned into a week of activity. Plus, the biggest short track race of the year coming up this weekend in Pensacola, Florida. We've got one of the top drivers headed down to talk with us before the day is over. And of course, we'll even get a chance to talk a little bit about Kyle Busch. All that will be speeding up next on Pit Pass. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batters Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batters Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batters Box Bar and Grill, and thanks again for sponsoring the show. Bandwidth for today's show is brought to you by SoftLayer.com. We love SoftLayer here at Talkopolis. They are the greatest hosting company ever. They make everything easy. Check out their website at SoftLayer.com. Thanks again for sponsoring the show. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Joe Williams, my partner, Larry Woody, and welcome to Pit Pass. Larry, the NASCAR season is over. They've now moved to their uh, week-long orgy of excess, as I sometimes call it. NASCAR going to Las Vegas, Nevada for Champion Week. As the, and we'll get into some of the things that take up a whole week out in, in Las And it can only be done as it can be done in Las Vegas, and, and one of my favorite cities. So I, I, They know how to do glitch. In boy, Vegas, do they it? not. Do they not. But, Larry, this a big difference. What we call Champions Week now in Las Vegas, a big, big difference from uh, most of the modern era of NASCAR, as we'll call it. I remember when the, the biggest thing that ever happened to NASCAR outside of the racetrack was moving the awards dinner to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City so they could be close to uh, all the advertisers. The, the, the Big Apple, the big show in the Big Apple. And I remember, Joe, what a big deal it was. Like you say, that first year, I think it was, was 81 because I covered it. And the reason I covered it for the Tennessean was we had the Darrell Waltrip angle. Darrell had just won the first championship, his first uh, cup championship. I'd been in Riverside to cover the final race. And then our sports editor, John Bibbs, said, go to New York and cover the awards banquet because Darrell's on stage. Plus, it's a big deal back then. Yeah. Local media actually covered racing. So anyway, the great Joe Caldwell and I <laughs> hop on a plane and go to New York City so you can imagine the rest of that. We won't tell you about ice skating in Rockefeller Center because that's still kind of sensitive with the New York Police Department. <laughs> but anyway, we had a, a good time was had by all. And as you say, it was not only New York City, New York City, it was in the Waldorf. And yeah. not only in the Waldorf, it was in the Grand Ballroom, you know, where kings and princesses and pre presidents, those yeah. people hang out. And here we are, the, the, the Bubba's from NASA car with uh, Bud Moore and one of the highlights was Bud Moore in the uh, lounge one afternoon trying to order a drink at a, from a waitress across the way and if you've ever heard Bud Moore's nasal North Carolina twang you can imagine it echoing off the walls <laughs> in the grand ballroom <laughs> when the Bud hollers out for a waitress but anyway it's a great event a good time. Uh, Governor Alexander went down. Gary Baker from the Speedway was there. Just everybody in Tennessee was there to wish Darrell Walter well with his first one. Of course, Darrell made his, his usual great uh, acceptance speech. And back then, it was sponsored by Winston and Bush Beer and so forth. And I remember Darrell got on the stage at the Waldorf and told everybody to keep drinking and smoking, <laughs> <laughs> and got a, a chuckle out of that. But you're right. I, I, and but Joe, despite all the, the the bigness of the Big Apple. It just wasn't well received in New York City. NASCAR just didn't fit in well, and I think it was a good move to move it to Vegas because, like you say, you got the glitz and the glitter, and Vegas has NASCAR racing. You know, yeah. they got the Las Vegas Speedway, so it's kind of a natural hold your NASCAR awards banquet in a city that also supports the sport, the sport year round, as does the track at uh, Vegas. But you're right, you know, how much is too much? That's a debate. You know, it's, it's uh, personally, I think to go a bit overboard, but I'm with it kind of like football college football bowls if you don't want to watch don't watch so yeah. you know if people like it and all the stage shows and entertainment and so forth good good weekend in vegas if you don't want to watch don't watch the 
two uh, support divisions to the Cup Series, if you will, the Nationwide Series mm -hmm. and the Camping World Trucks. Uh, both held their awards dinners on Sunday night or Monday night after the last uh, race at Homestead, Miami. Those guys got their checks. They went home. Everything was good. As that was last week that, that yeah. those things happened. Uh, the Cup Series, of course, decides to go to Las Vegas. Larry, some of the things they're doing. There'll be show cars dancing all around the strip at different places uh, all week long. Yeah. There's a fan fest which is a, a red carpet game show format. They're going to bring drivers down a red carpet, put them on stage. It's hosted by Carrot Top. One of the great NASCAR personalities of all time, of course. Carrot Top. <laughs> They've got some entertainment I hadn't heard of, which, you know, that's no, no dig on entertainment because yeah. I'm so old I hadn't heard most <laughs> about most of the modern acts. But yeah, Carrot Top, you know, he's been around. I, I'm kidding about being supporting NASCAR. He does show up at the tracks, and he's kind of a fixture around the tracks, playing obviously to the younger audience. But uh, again, I don't have any problem with if it draws a crowd, gets some good positive exposure for the sport. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. But again, it's a, maybe a bit excessive it, for some of us. Is it too touchy feely? Some, some of us older generation uh, followers of the sport. I, I guess when you when you look at the whole schedule that they have for the week, you can literally there's literally something going on all day from t from the start of the uh, the motorsports marketing. Mm -hmm seminar on Tuesday all the way through till uh, till Saturday and there's something yeah. almost every day a couple of big things are going to come out of this one of the things that's going to happen Chevrolet is going to unveil their new race car the SS race car yeah. I don't know if it's an Impala SS yeah. if it's a Malibu SS right now they're just calling it the SS yeah. let's hope it looks like a Chevrolet too well it's an, another new car yeah. hopefully it's going to look like a Chevrolet one of the things, though, uh, there's some changes that are coming. And the NASCAR Senior Vice President for Race Operations, uh, Steve O'Donnell, shared a little bit. One of the things we're proud of is the collaboration um, that you've heard throughout the industry with NASCAR, the race teams, the manufacturers, and ultimately everything that we do is for the, for the race fans. What you're seeing up here today is some changes uh, to the look of the car, uh, and this uh, comes about from working relationship with the race teams. We know that we needed to offer them some additional space, some additional things for sponsors in this day and age. So you're gonna see some different areas where the sponsor will be able to put their logo, particularly on the roof, um, that has not happened in the past. One of the other additions that we've looked at that we're proud of, and, and uh, especially as we look to younger drivers coming up in the series, is the driver's last name on the windshield. Okay, Larry, we're gonna go now and open up the roof. Mm for sponsor mm -hmm. logos. Mm -hmm. And the roof has historically been reserved for the car number. Number and, and driver name. Now, yeah. part of that, you know, when when we first came out with in-car cameras, you had the roof cam to begin with, and then somebody got smart and put their sponsor where the camera would pick it up. Right. Larry, I'm trying to figure out how you can get a logo big enough to be seen on the roof of a race car if the number is the correct mandated size. Well, they could, NASCAR mandate is in the eye of the beholder. NASCAR can mandate anything yeah. it wants to. You could have a, you might end up with little tiny numbers. Obviously, they put numbers on race cars the same reason they put them on football and basketball jerseys. So the fans, to help the fans pick out their, their car numbers and identify, you know, keep up with who's, who's running where. If they shrink the numbers, it might make it harder to see. Obviously, you put it on top of the car because in racing, a lot of the fans are Yep. kind of looking down on the top of the car. So it's easier to read on the back stretch. Easier to read, sure. Yeah. So uh, again, I don't know, it's, it'll be interesting when they unveil these cars to see how it uh, does. I'm, I'm curious myself. But I do think, Joe, it's a, a step in the right direction because you and I have heard in recent years fans complaining because they can't identify with the car models. In the old days, you had your Chevy fans, your Ford fans, so forth, and a lot of fans, or some fans, would identify with the makes of models and you know what the car dealers, you yourself being affiliate, affiliated with car yep. dealers, the old saying was you win on, on Sunday, Sunday and you sell on Monday. Monday. Yeah. So that's how, how strong the ties, the loyalship, uh, loyalty was to these car dealerships that they, some fans, if, if Darrell Waltrip drove a Chevy, by golly, they were going to drive yep. a Chevy. If Richard Petty drove a Dodge, where's my Dodge? And it was that, that close. Now, having said that, Joe, 
I've sensed in recent years a little drifting away from that identification with models because the younger generation is not car guys like you and I were growing up. We don't work, people, kids don't work on their cars. They don't identify with those models quite so much. But I do think in NASCAR's case, it's a step in the right direction and also try to make the stock cars a little more stock. I think yeah. regardless of the model, make them a little more like the when the, the car that Jeff Gordon, the Chevy Jeff Gordon races on Sunday, make it kind of like the Chevy that you and I might drive or Ford or whatever the model is through the week. A couple of other things, that, uh, the, the now they're requiring the name up on top of the windshield, mm -hmm. which strikes me as uh, a capitulation, if you will, that we've gotten so expensive, drivers no longer have mm -hmm. one sponsor for the whole year, or we have cars that have multiple multiple drivers. Mm -hmm. The only way you're going, you know, who, who's on first? Who's your scorecard? Yeah. Who's the put, number fifty-one? Yeah, put the number. <laughs> put the put yeah. the name on the windshield. Yeah. Larry was talking about uh, cars looking more and more like street cars. Guess what, Larry? I think NASCAR has actually listened and heard us. And last but, but not least is certainly the manufacturer presence. Um, it's important for us to to make that car look as as uh, as much as we can, like the production vehicle you see on the streets. Uh, so moving some logos around with the manufacturers, moving some numbers off the headlights and the taillights, again, all in an effort um, to have that car reflect what's on the street, and most importantly, make it easier for our fans to identify who's in that car, race in and race out. Joe, I once asked a, a, a mechanic, NASCAR mechanic, we were looking at a stock car walking around looking at it, I said, if you went to a, a dealership and bought a car, I said, what parts on this car would be identical to the parts that I would buy at the dealership. And he said, maybe the rear, the rear deck lid, <laughs> the, the trunk lid. The trunk lid. He said, other than that, it. there's nothing stock on a stock car. And yeah. if you think about it, there's not. You, there's nothing on those, those NASCAR stock cars that you could actually go to your local car dealership, some of your, your friends sure. here in town, and, and buy those particular parts that would you know, yeah. that go on a street car. Maybe that's something that, that eventually they're going to come back to. You know, one, I'll come back and I've said all, I, for, for 30 years now that, that the success that we enjoyed after NASCAR pulled out in 85, 86, and 87 when, when, the, when, when Gary Baker was there. We when, being when, Middle Tennessee racing yeah, fans. exactly. The success at the fairground specifically was the fact that Joe Carver, who came in in 84 and switched from the old Grand American Camaro type cars, to late model stock cars, we never heard of them around here, but he was firm and strong and said, you will run factory sheet metal. These cars will look like what's on the road. We had some growing pains and had to do some changes to make it work, but by 85 and 86, Larry, that was the thing, because you had kids coming in going, daddy, daddy, that's, yeah. that's the same kind of car. It looks just like our car we came here in. Yeah. That's how we built that fan base. Yeah. And, uh, and again, when, uh, when Bill France Sr. decided to found Stock Car Racing, yeah. National Association thereof, in Florida back in the, in the, I guess, late 30s, early 40s, I guess they had the idea in the late 30s, got it off the ground, mid 40s. Anyway, some, somebody said, no, fans don't want to see that. You're not going to put stock cars out on a track and fans go see them. He said, no, that's what the Moonshine Runners race, yeah. and they draw crowds, so that's yeah. what Bill France Sr. said, I'm going to do. I'm going yeah. to make stock cars stock, and if you remember the first stock car race that was held on an old track down near Charlotte, the guy who won it was disqualified because they found a p piece of the car that wasn't stock. Exactly. And so they disqualified him, and the first stock car winner was turned out not to be the winner. Nobody's, but anyway, yeah. I, I think I think old man France had the right idea 60 years ago, and I still think his grandson Brian realizes that and is going to get back to what his grandfather did that made this sport so successful. I think he's probably right. Coming up next, we're going to talk with a young man headed to Pensacola, Florida for the biggest short track race in the country now, the Snowball Derby. Mason Mingus will be joining us, a four-sport athlete. We'll talk about that. As we uh, leave and get ready to get him in here, I want to say a special hello to Highland Rim Speedway up in Ridgetop, Tennessee. You want to see cars that have factory sheet metal? they got a bunch of divisions that have factory sheet metal. Looking for a good Saturday night, weekend, family place to go. Start making your plans now for the 2013 season at Highland Rim Speedway. We'll be back right after this. Microcasting for your city. Talkopolis. From the family grocery hauler to fire-breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor and Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615 726 
1-800-926-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. Welcome back, everybody, to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with my idol, Larry Woody, on the right side. And stuck in the middle between us, Mason Mingus, who this weekend will be down in Pensacola, Florida, for the biggest short track race of the year, the 45th annual Snowball Derby. And Mason, welcome in. You've got, uh, man, you've got a lot on your plate. Yes, sir. I'm staying busy all week this week. Now, how busy is this young man? Now, he's a student at Franklin Road Academy here in Nashville. He's a state uh, qualifier, came very close to winning the state title last year in wrestling, um, a track athlete, a football player. In addition to racing, you had a wrestling match yesterday, right? Yes, sir. And then you're going to go race this weekend. How, do you ever sleep? Not too much. I'm actually leaving to go to Pensacola today, so it's... um. It's been a pretty busy week so far. I've been a pretty busy whole year, actually. 71 entrants in the Snowball Derby. Let's take a look at uh, who some of those are. Now, the top 30, I understand when you get there, are locked in from qualifying, and then everybody else gets to fight for a way in, right? Yes, sir. Tyler Miles from Pulaski is going. There you are. Uh, Clay Alexander down at Franklin Way will be going. But here's some of the other names. Landon Castle, Nelson Piquet, Jr., Kyle Busch, Stephen Wallace, Cale Gale, who just won his first race. I wonder if uh, Kyle will try to get even in a non-NASCAR <laughs> event. Chase yeah. Elliott. These are pretty big names. And but Mason, you're not locked in, I understand. Yeah. You, you have to have no, to sir. We go through qualifying race your way in. on Thursday. How, how many guys, how many drivers are you going to compete with approximately to get uh, one of these other spots? Um, well, all of them. We all have to qualify. I don't think anybody's locked in going into the race. So they'll take the top 30 out of qualifying and then you'll have last chance races the next day. Okay, so you, you got a last chance race to get in if you don't qualify. Yes, sir. Okay. And Joe said, what, about 70-something? 70 71 total entries. So for this you, you, you and 70 other guys are competing <laughs> for how many starting spots in the snowball? There's going to be 36 at start. 36. Yeah, so, so you got to figure, Larry, you take the top 30 in qualifying, that leaves 41 guys trying to get six spots. Those aren't, I mean, those odds are maybe a little bit better than the half a billion Powerball later tonight, <laughs> but they're not a whole lot better. But at least you're in charge of your own destiny, unlike yeah, Powerball, yeah. You just, it's a blind draw. Here you can actually control. Are you pretty confident, Mason, that you're going to make this race? I am. I'm confident. We had a good car two years ago, made the race my first year down there and ran seventh. And um, last year, unfortunately, didn't because we got um, wrecked in practice and yeah. um, ran into an incident in the last chance race, but had a good car with a backup car. And um, we went down and tested last weekend. And I think we had a we had a good race car. On top of my normal late model team, we had uh, two guys from our ARCA team with Wintron Racing come down to help us, and they're going to be down there this week to help us. Mason, what's the charm of the Snowball Derby? As Joe said, it's one of maybe the premier non-NASCAR races in the country. Is that it? It's just a chance to run with some of these big names like Kyle Busch and these guys? Absolutely. It's just a way to get your name out there, kind of bragging rights, really. Um, there's no points title on the line. It's anything pretty much goes, and everybody's trying to win. Years ago, there was kind of a, a triad, if you will, of big races at the end of the year. After points titles were, were decided, um, there, was, there was a run at Winchester, Indiana. Then you came to Nashville for the All-American 400 uh, in October. Bob Harmon put together a Thanksgiving race a couple of years over in uh, Myrtle Beach. But typically, the two things you hit were the All-American 400 in October, and then you got ready for the snowball in December. And uh, for 45 years, this has just been, like I said, one of the top races. It's now the premier event. Mason, how do you like the racetrack down there compared, I mean, compared to some of the other places you've been? The, the whole, the issue had always been these three tracks were pretty well similar, but with their own little personality quirks, I'll call it. Is that still the case? Absolutely. Um, Pensacola and Five Flags Speedway is, it's a tough track to get a handle on, especially for the first time. And um, to try to get the car set up, it takes a long time. We use every bit of practice we get for three days to try to get the car dialed in. And um, it gets a real slick track. It eats away tires really bad. And so you really have to focus on qualifying. And then after that, they give you another day of practice um, on Saturday. And we get to uh, dial the car in for the race setup. Now, practice starts in the morning somewhere around 9 o'clock, I think. Uh, on Thursday morning. Yes, sir. So you've got to get there this evening and be ready for the morning. But literally, it is 
all consuming going into qualifying Friday night. Absolutely. We're we're there all day long Thursday and all day long Friday trying to get the car dialed in, making three or four lap runs, just focused on qualifying. Mason, with more and more short tracks like our old fairgrounds here cutting back or cutting out entirely, the chances for a young guy like yourself to really sell himself and showcase his talents are, are declining and a shot like this is they're, they're hard to come by, so I, I can imagine the pressure on young guys like yourself who really have a chance with the eyes of the racing world on you this coming weekend to really get out there and do your best. It is. It's There is quite a bit of pressure on, on us, and uh, luckily I've been there twice already, so that helps a lot You're going down. You're an old down. veteran. At, <laughs> yeah. At 18, he's <laughs> an old veteran. Yeah. 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 You're 17. <laughs> I guess you're still 18, seven. Turned 18 today. Just, just turned 18. So your birthday. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. And, and looking ahead, Mason, you, you said next year you're going to run the entire, the full ARCA circuit. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's this a year, lot of travel, isn't it? It's a lot of travel. We go yeah. all the way across the country, really. Um, this year I got to run the short tracks because yeah. it wasn't 18, but I'm going to go test Daytona in December, and we're going to get to run full season. And obviously your, your, your design, your long-range plan is to keep moving up the rungs of the ladder and hopefully be in the Cup Series someday. That's the goal, yes, sir. Now, you, you face some pressure situations, I know, because I, I, I know through football and wrestling, et cetera. But none, I don't think, I'm going to guess, you've looked forward to as much as going to Daytona in December to test. That's that, exactly uh, right. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a big learning opportunity for me, definitely. And I've never been on a track or done anything close to this. So, um, I'm looking forward to it, and Daytona is where every racer wants to race, so it's going to be an awesome opportunity to get to go out there. Tell me a little bit about the team you're going to be running with. I'm running for Winchon Racing. They're actually based out of Minnesota right now, and um, hopefully um, we're going to get to run all the races with them. That's the goal. And um, they're, they're an outstanding team. worked with them this year, and they've been great with helping me learn um, the transition into ARCA from a late model because they're completely different cars. Mason, you and I discussed on the Terrell Davis radio show, Pit Pass, about some of the, 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 the uh, challenges when you're living in, in Franklin, Brentwood, Nashville, and you're driving for a racing team in Minnesota. Discuss a little about the logistics involved when your driver's down here and the rest of the team is up there. Yeah, it is tough because um, I don't get to be up there with them in the shop every day like I would like to. And that's kind of the challenge we face in late model stuff too. Um, my crew chief and car owner is out of Louisville, Kentucky, and which isn't a far drive, but with racing and uh, wrestling and track and everything on top of it, it's hard to make it up there a lot. So we just stay in, stay in touch throughout the week and um, there's, it just takes a lot of communication while we're at the and track. On, on, on race day, race weekend, the, the crew, the team brings the car and the, the, the personnel to the track and you meet them at the track and that's when you get together and that's really your first practice time, isn't it? It yeah. is. We, you know, occasionally we'll get to go test, but it's the same thing. We're just meeting them at the track and uh, it's, it takes a lot, of, a lot of quick learning on everybody's part um, at the racetrack. Now, <laughs> if you've got all this, have you thought about getting your pilot's license? I have, um, just seriously. <laughs> haven't really, haven't really had the time right now. My, um, my dad is. Me and him have been talking about uh, me getting my pilot's license, but um, got to wait till I have a little bit of free time. And well, free time's kind of hard. That, 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 we had me for a long time, will it? Have you asked your prom date yet? Have you got to <laughs> look ahead to, to that? But it, it is put a, cr a cramp on your social life. I guess that's one to. of the sacrifices that a young guy's got to make nowadays if you're going to do succeed in this sport. It's almost. Uh, a 24-7 kind of deal, isn't it, Mason? No, it is, actually. And um, actually, for homecoming this year, I played in Friday night, and then the homecoming dance was on Saturday, and we had a race in Decoin. So we <laughs> flew up there and actually got my girlfriend to go with me to the racetrack instead of the homecoming. <laughs> now, Very that's, understanding. That's supportive. <laughs> right? I like that. Yeah. Of course, that was a dirt, that's a dirt track. That's one thing ARCA does. I asked you earlier. You know, they got a couple of dirt tracks on their schedule. You've got dirt track experience in your background? Um, not till this year. <laughs> I had actually never even seen a dirt race in person until the night before we watched the USAC race that night. Um, so we only actually got an hour of practice the next day in the ARCA car, but it was a lot of fun. That was actually one of my favorite tracks. It's cool just to go do something different for a weekend. And same ARCA runs a road course too. That was definitely a big learning experience for me. Now, we, we talk, let's get back to uh, the snowball this weekend. You're going down, these guys that are going with you. You compete against each other here. Now, when you get to Pensacola, is it... Uh, you, you guys kind of get a little closer and a little bit of us versus them mentality going? Yeah, I mean, you know, you always want to support the guys that come from Tennessee, but, um, you know, everybody's trying to make the race. It's kind of, you know, you're for yourself, really, to try to get in the show, but you definitely show them respect, but try to respect everybody, too. Now, on Saturday, I noticed you're not entered in the, the 
secondary race, I'll call it the Snowflake. One, it's a 100-lap race on Saturday. Got a couple of guys from here uh, in the area. Tyler Miles is going to apparently try to pull double duty. And then Joseph Myers out of Mount Juliet is going down to uh, to run that Saturday race. How much, if once you're locked in and everything's set, how much fun is it to sit back and watch that 100 lap on Saturday night? It's a lot of fun, and it, it helps you kind of get ready for the next day and for the race. You kind of can see what's, what's going to play out, what's going to happen over 100 laps. Um, I always like to stay that night and watch the race. We always make sure we stay in before we go out to eat. And, um, and it's good, it's good uh, just refresher for what's going to come because you haven't raced there in a year. Mason, growing up, 18 we're saying, <laughs> since you're growing up, as a little boy though, I know you started racing go-karts when you were a kid. As your career has developed, you've progressed up the, the ladder. Are there any racers, cup guys, or, or non-NASCAR guys that you've kind of sort of idolized or, or, or patterned your, your behavior after, maybe your driving style after? Any, any racing idols out there? Well, I've always liked Carl Edwards. Um, he actually came up through the Baby Grands, which I moved up into after I raised Mini Cups. Yeah. And he won a championship in Baby Grands, and I um, won the Eastern Championship. He won the Western Championship. And um, so hopefully I can continue that and end up in, in Cup like he did. And then you'll have to do the back, back flip off, the, uh, off your car. Like yeah, I don't know does. about that. <laughs> so are, you, are you carrying the, the card that says Mason Mingus, race car driver for hire? <laughs> <laughs> the way way Carl Edwards did handed up business yeah. cards. Now, if we want to keep up with Mason, you got a website we can go visit. We do um, MasonMingusRacing.com, and you can also um, follow us on Twitter. It's just at Mason underscore Mingus, and we have a Facebook page. Got it all together. <laughs> hey, good luck this weekend. Thank you. Hopefully, I think we'll uh, be hearing a lot of Mason yeah. Mingus in, in years to come. A bright young guy, smart and very driven. Yep. Knows what he wants to do and knows how to do it. Bring, bring a trophy home, will you? I'm try to. Daddy's worried about the check. You worried about the trophy. <laughs> exactly All right. right. All right. We got to say a special hello, too, to our friends at USA Motor Machine over on Cleveland Avenue. Hey, if it's your regular car or if you're looking to, you know, kind of race car stuff, uh, there are a lot of options, but USA Machine, Motor and Machine, one of the best here locally. Mason, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Good, Good luck, luck and be careful. And drive safely to get there. <laughs> All right. We're going to come back and wrap up Pit Pass right after this. Microcasting for your city. Talkopolis. And welcome back, everybody, to the final segment of this edition of Pit Pass. Joe Williams and Larry Woody and, and Larry. That kid's going to do well. Mason Mingus. Mason Mingus is yeah. going to do well. He's, he's got the talent, he's got the personality, the charisma, he handles himself well with the media and in public, and he's a heck of a race driver. So, yeah, he's got the whole uh, the whole package. We end today with just a couple of notes and, and kind of nuts and bolts things that we're finishing up on. Larry, we've been some discussion about Nashville Super Speedway out in Gladeville that uh, has been sitting basically idle, uh, except for some testing. And uh, mm -hmm. I understand this week, that uh, there's actually an offer been made. Uh, we've heard a couple of names before. You know, we've talked about Tony Stewart being involved. My understanding is uh, Tony really is involved and may be bringing a couple of his buddies with him. Yeah, I've heard some, that there have been inquiries made, as they say, with Dover Motorsports. And I think it's probably a good time to, to do some bargaining because, as you say, Joe, that track, it's a, it's a money pit and it's sitting idle. There's nothing coming in and a lot going out. So Dover might be willing to sit down and negotiate with Tony and some of his partners if they're really interested in it. And I hope they are. I hope, uh, you know, for the sake of the, uh, of the racing fans around here and the track itself and the sport itself, I'd like to see that track crank up. It's a beautiful facility. As you know, we've spent a lot of time working out there calling races. I hope, it, uh, I hope something comes out of it. I'm almost afraid to get my hopes up too much because it's still maybe a long shot, but I think it's at least a possible shot. What I'm hearing is, uh, well, of course, Tony already owns a couple of... Uh dirt tracks yep. this would kind of fit well nascar now lifting the ban as we talked about before they can you know they can practice anywhere it would kind of make sense yep. um one other note that i found interesting I, after i got to look at this i heard this yesterday um for whatever it's worth the dover motorsports stock is up almost 12 percent the last seven days in a and market that's been going the other way and again joe it's interesting you mentioned the, the nascar's change of policy about uh, testing starting next year teams will be able to test on NASCAR tracks tracks that host NASCAR races so if 
the super speedway doesn't become, it doesn't get back on track and start running, that's going to be a real blow to Dover's revenue because, as you said earlier, most of what little revenue is coming in has been from testing. Mm -hmm. And the reason they were doing, the speedway has been attractive in the past, it didn't run NASCAR races, so it could be a NASCAR te uh, track, testing track, all that's going away next year. So a little more uh, maybe incentive for Dover to unload the track. Well, and that's one of the things that I, I really believe uh, caused the financial issues that led to the closing was when they were running the NASCAR events and everybody could come test, the, the revenue was good. Right. But when NASCAR put in the rule that says, no, you can't test on a track that runs any of our series, yeah. bang, there went their revenue. And you got to understand, you're talking about a facility that's in use 220 to 260 days a year, yeah. but now with this ban, now you've lost, you know, quarter to 40 percent of that that's a huge hit on revenue and the revenue was good and if you can't test on it what can you do with it exactly and i'm not sure if there's anything you can if if you don't have races on it and you can't do testing on it not much you can do with the racetrack no it's just a big old piece of concrete so hopefully the the rumors and we've heard these circulating our friend terrell davis i think kind of broke the story even back in the spring that tony and some of his people might be interested in inquiring about maybe purchasing perhaps possibly <laughs> the super speedway so uh, and maybe a roundabout could be kind yeah, of way yeah and 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 he and you know his uh, old uh uh, team owner Joe Gibbs, they've got some pretty deep pockets. Tony's, we know that he's interested in being a track owner because he already is. He owns a dirt track, uh, you know, and his partners and, and one or two more. So he's interested in that, that aspect of the sport. And Tony, with his connections, you know, NASCAR connections and so forth, I think he could bring back a lot of these races. We know NASCAR would like to bring the truck series and nationwide series back. And who knows, you get back and who knows what the future might hold? You know the sports. Oh, don't even sports, say that word. Sports evolving. So anyway, it'd be good to have something on the on the super speedway. And maybe it may be able to come about. I was afraid you were going to say the c word. Oh. No, let's not go there. Finally, yeah. speaking of Nashville Super yeah. Speedway, one of the uh, one of the iconic things they'll always be known for <laughs> was the Kyle Busch meltdown when he destroyed that beautiful Sam Bass designed Gibson guitar. Hard for me. Still, you were there that night. Talk about it. I should have done something. Do dodging I did. guitar shrapnel. In I the... should have done something. But anyways, Kyle destroyed the guitar. Did karma get him? Has it finally caught up with him? Well, you know, even he says it's been a rotten year. I think it's been well documented that this has been the absolute worst year of my career, uh, bar none. You know, whether it was racing ASA cars or late models or Legends cars or even being here in the big three, you know, winning 20 plus races a year. Uh, it's, it's a huge disappointment. You know, you don't. I, I mean, cup races, sure, they're hard to they're hard to win. But you know, in the last three weeks, I should have won Martinsville. I could have moved Jimmy out of the way. I could have dive bombed the two of them in Texas and probably won that one. And then Phoenix, I gave away because I chose the wrong lane on a restart. So it's just, you know, you can't seem to put it all together when it matters. And uh, you have to in the sport. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll be kind of shut the door. Now, Larry, I know you have a you, you like I like Kyle Busch as a driver. I think he's got a great amount of talent. Um, is this the typical Kyle Busch blaming or explaining everything away, or is this a maturing Kyle Busch who says, you know, here's what happened? Yeah, I could have, but I didn't. When maybe years ago I would have. What did you call it, NASCAR Armageddon? Yeah, <laughs> I, I call it NASCAR Karma. Okay. What goes yeah. around and comes around. Yeah. I think Carl, uh, Kyle ran up some pretty big uh, debts and is having to eat some humble pie now. Having said that, he's clearly the most exciting driver on the track. When Kyle's there in any form of racing, trucks, nationwide, or cup, there's a, a static electricity crackles all around him. People watch him because they don't know what he's going to do. He he's, reminds me a lot, uh, Joe, frankly, of Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt had that same. Uh, you know, same kind of aura about him. There's always something going to, when Earnhardt's in the vicinity, something's going to happen, good or bad. The difference in Earnhardt is he kept it on the track. Kyle has a propensity to take his stuff off the track and the, and the, the silly juvenile antics, like you mentioned, smashing the uh, that beautiful Gibson guitar in, in the victory circle at the super speedway after a nationwide race. That was about as low as low can go. 
And I think things like that, eventually they accumulate and they, they haunt him, they weigh him down. We saw what happened to his big brother, you know, he wore out yep. his welcome eventually and is now struggling to keep his racing career alive. I think Kyle probably looks at Kurt and says, I don't want to be there. So to his credit, I think he's trying to make a conscious effort to, to straighten himself up. I, th I hope, Joe, he can walk a fine balance between, between coming too, too tame and docile and still have some yep. of that, that racing exciting edge that, that we'd like to see on the track. Yeah. So strike a balance. Yeah, and that's why I'm wondering if, if maybe that interview is not showing that the young man is actually beginning to mature now. At least it got his attention. We, yeah, we know that. hopefully. Yeah. Now, Kyle, here's the thing you've got to remember, partner. This show is based out of Nashville, Tennessee. You really think we're ever going to let you forget the guitar? No. No. That's something that will be here forever. Now, in fairness, he did give, I think, 100 guitars to the local schools, and, and he's done everything he can. Which made it worse, in my opinion. Well, instead, I, instead of yeah. simply apologize, yeah. he tries to throw some money at it, which pro athletes tend to do these days when they get in trouble. Instead of do, trying to do the right thing, they just have one of their agents toss them some money and write them a check and think that, that solves the problem, and the next week to go out and do it again. So no, I, I, that didn't impress me by Kyle donating some guitars or throwing some money at the problem. But what does impress me is when he, he looks in the camera and says, I really screwed this thing up. Yeah. I'm going to try not to do it again. Well, and the other half is, you know, give him credit. He hasn't done it since. He has, he, you know, I can't, if he wins a grandfather clock, is he going to, you know, throw well, it? No. He's that's what disturbed well. me about yeah. the Super Speedway incident, Joe. He, he, he considered it a minor league race, a minor league venue, and minor league fans, and he thought he could pull those sophomores, you know, juvenile antics here because we were, we were, we weren't, uh, yeah, deserving any, any kind star. of respect. He, he, Kyle would not, not have done that if he'd won the Daytona 500 no. and Mike Hilton and Brian France had handed him a guitar. He wouldn't have dashed it to pieces in victory circle at Daytona as he did at the Super Speedway. I thought he was really disrespectful for the area racing fans, and yeah. that's what upset me about Kyle. But he's getting better. Maybe. And for the, hopefully. Maybe. And for, hopefully. <laughs> and for that, Kyle. We, we, uh, we do want to give you props. Folks, thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Pit Pass. Larry, Woody, and I may well be on our way, maybe on our way to the batter's box over at 43 Hermitage Avenue. Good place to yep. maybe grab lunch, watch a little sports on TV. And, of course, they help make all this possible. If not, you know, you never know when we're going to show up or where. Woody's shown up in some places that, well, we won't go. Uninvited there. or otherwise. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For Larry Woody, I'm Joe Williams. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time on Pit Pass. Microcasting for your city. Talkopolis.